Good afternoon, a very warm welcome to you to the UCL Lunch Hour Lecture Series. You can see that the Darwin has gone planetarium style today uh, because we're about to have a very special lecture on cosmic archaeology and it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Amélie Saint-Onge, who is a Royal Society Fellow and also a lecturer in astrophysics at UCL. And she has been peering into time and space and studying the origins of galaxies and she's going to tell us all about it. Welcome, Dr. Saint-Onge. Welcome everybody to this lunch hour lecture. It's my greatest pleasure to be here today. And I hope to be able to tell you a little bit about uh, the secrets of the universe. Now, I don't have the answers to all the questions about um, the universe, but I want to put some emphasis on those that uh, galaxies can help us to unravel. So the study of cosmology aims to understand the origin structure, nature, and composition of the universe. And this is a summary of what our understanding is of this universe. So it starts on the left uh, with the moment of the Big Bang, after which the universe was a very dense, very hot uh, soup of you know, fundamental particles. Um, that universe expanded up to the present day where we, you know, we have galaxies and stars and planets. So the focus of this talk, what I want to tell you about, is not so much about the universe itself, but about how we learn about all of this. So we'll start with one of the most information-rich pictures that astrophysicists have to find out about. The history of the universe. Sorry. Yes, okay. Um, right, so we'll start with this glorious picture. Uh, this is an all sky picture of uh, uh, you know, whatever is out there that has been observed at, uh, at wavelengths of about a millimeter. Um, so this is the cosmic microwave background. Um, it's a bit of a cheat to show, show it like that. I think the, the honest thing is to show it like this at first. So this is how it comes straight out of the telescope. This is the same all sky picture, but what we see now um, is mostly our own galaxy. So the bright line in the center here is material that is within the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. If we look in detail, we can see some of the you know, brightest nearby galaxies. Um, so this is here, the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, Andromeda is somewhere on the other side. Um, but to extract information about the very early universe, we first need to clean this up. We need to not worry about anything that's close to us. And once we remove all these galaxies, or everything that's close by, we're left with this, which is an image of the universe as it was uh, a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So this is the deepest, deepest in space and time that we can look. And this, from in this, this image, by analyzing all these little bumps which show us how temperature varies across the sky, uh, we can know something about the composition of the universe, how much matter there is, how much dark matter, how much energy. Um, and it can tell us something about the age of the universe and how it grows. Um, so this is wonderful, uh, wonderfully rich, but it's limited in the sense that it doesn't tell us about what happens in detail from that point on. How do we end up with galaxies? How do we end up with stars and planets? So uh, before I tell you how galaxies can help us answer these questions, we'll talk about galaxies themselves, right? If we want to use them as a tool to understand something, we need to understand the tool first. So let's do a small exercise. So let's all try to picture a galaxy in our head. Okay. Close your eyes if that helps. Imagine a galaxy, right? Now, how many of you pictured something that looked a little bit like this? Let's be honest, yes. Or something like this, right? So most of you, I'm sure, pictured something like this. But just to show you that galaxies come in a much, much, much broader range of shapes. Um, so this is a galaxy as well. This is uh, a, what we call an elliptical galaxy. It's a massive galaxy at the center of the Virgo cluster. I mean, this, uh, this is a galaxy as well. Well, to be more exact, these are two galaxies that are running into each other. So galaxies uh, do not live in isolation. They interact with each other. 
uh, this is a galaxy as well. Well, actually, there are lots of galaxies in this picture. All the small reddish blobs are galaxies. But what I mean is that most of everything you see as these blue dots are stars that belong to one galaxy. So this, this is one of the faintest, lowest mass galaxies that we know. It's a satellite that orbits around the Milky Way galaxy. And to know exactly how many of these ultra-faint galaxies exist tells us, again, a lot about the universe. So if we put all of that to scale, so this is a composition of picture. The big galaxy at the center is a representation of the Milky Way. Obviously, we can't uh, take a direct picture, so this is an artist's impression of what the uh, Milky Way must look like. And we have some other famous galaxies from the nearby universe around it. Uh, so to put this in context, so I put this circle. Now we'll step back and look how Milky Way galaxy compares to other famous galaxies. So the one on the top. Uh, is the big elliptical galaxy we were looking at earlier. So you can see already how the Milky Way is significantly smaller than this. And there's you know, dwarf galaxies that are you know, barely visible on this plot. And we can even take a step back and look at something like this. Now the Milky Way is down here in its little orange circle. And what we're seeing just above it is the largest galaxy we know of at this point. It's a massive elliptical galaxy that lives at the center of a galaxy cluster. So when we do this, we take pictures of countless galaxies and we can measure their properties, their sizes, their masses, their colors. Um, <coughs> but that's not really science, right? Astrophysics is a quantitative science, so we need to move from pretty pictures to numbers. Uh, so this is the kind of thing we do to extract information from these galaxies. So we'll, we'll take our galaxies and we'll look at their color and their mass and convert that into numbers so we can start putting them on a plot like this. So some of our favorite galaxies will go like this. So at the bottom left, you'll have tiny dwarf galaxies that tend to be very blue and they, they don't have much mass. Whereas if you go to the top right, this is where our big, massive elliptical galaxies will live because they tend to be very red. Right, so this is for three galaxies. What we do, we do these types of measurements for hundreds of thousands of galaxies and we can display them like this. And then we can see how there's structure that emerges here, right? You can see that there's, in this cloud of points, there are two regions of higher density. You can see that galaxies tend to be either bluish and low mass or to be red and very massive. So that tells us something, right? Galaxies are not just this mass of objects with a variety of properties. There is some organization in those, those properties. So this is two properties. Let's look at the third one, the shape of the galaxies. Right, so the, ver the variety of galaxies was first you know, uh, put into a framework by Edwin Hubble in 1926. We're talking just a few years after the discovery of, the, of galaxies as external uh, worlds to our own Milky Way. Now, there's two main uh, class classes of galaxies. On the left, we have elliptical galaxies, these massive reddish galaxies that tend to be featureless, whereas on the right, we have spiral galaxies, which have, which have these spiral arms. But this is much more than just a classification scheme uh, because the formation mechanisms of these different types of galaxies are different. So to be able to uh, separate them tells us something about how they might have formed and evolved. Right, so in our plot we had earlier, now we can look. So we look at the elliptical galaxies and a circle where these are in this plot uh, in red. And then I take the spiral, the spiral galaxies and I circle in blue where they are in our plot. And you can see this natural division, right? We can see yet more structure, more correlation between these properties of galaxies. Now, this is only three properties. There are dozens of them. I could show you uh, the chemical composition of the galaxies. I could show you how much gas they have, how fast they're rotating, and so on and so on. Um, it would take me a multi-dimensional space, and I would not be very practical. Um, but astronomers have now developed this vast network of relation between all the different physical properties of galaxies. And that's a very, very valuable tool for understanding their formation and evolution. Uh, but now we can do even one step better because we have beautiful things like this. So you might recognize the Hubble Space Telescope, which is arguably one of the most transformative pieces of scientific equipment ever built. Um, and it's not only a beautiful telescope, you know, a feat of human engineering, it's also a time machine of sorts. Because with telescopes like this, the further, if we look and take very deep pictures of the universe and look far, far away, we're looking back in time essentially because light 
takes uh, time to travel to us. So this picture uh, was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, it took about 12 days of non-stop observing to produce this picture. Um, it's only a very, very small fraction of the sky. It would cover only a tenth of the moon, for example. If we wanted to observe the entire sky with this, at this level, uh, it would take about uh, 13 million of these images to cover the entire sky, which would take about 400,000 years to do. So clearly, we're not going to go and do this. Yet, this is only this tiniest fraction of the universe. Um, but when we look at it in detail, we can find in there some of the earliest galaxies, the first galaxies that formed in the universe. So I'll just set you a bit of a challenge. Look at this. Try to see w which one of these would you think are these oldest, the first galaxies that formed in the universe? Well, it's a bit of a difficult question because they're barely visible. Um, but you can see them on the right here, and you see the little green boxes where they are in the the original images on the left. So these are galaxies that were in existence. We see them as they were uh, only a few hundred thousand years, uh, a few hundred million years after uh, the Big Bang, after the formation of the universe. So now we can observe these galaxies. Well, arguably, yes, we have less information about them than the beautiful galaxies we see in the local universe. Uh, but still, we can start building the same type of network of relation between the properties of these galaxies. So our complex multidimensional network of relation, we have it in the present day universe and we can have it as a function of time as well. So that teaches us about the evolution of galaxies. Now this is wonderful. This is you know, the limits of what we can do with telescopes. But it's not quite enough, right? It doesn't tell us about the physics. It doesn't teach us exactly how galaxies assemble and evolve. And this is where we turn to uh, supercomputers. So this is an example of a simulation that's been done on a massive computer. So it's the same uh, patch of sky we're looking. On the left, we're looking at stars. On the right, we're looking at the gas. So this starts uh, in, in the, when the universe was you know, a few billion years old. And you see how several spiral elliptic galaxies are coming together, merging, interacting, uh, which leads to bursts of star formation, which leads to the uh, shapes to evolve, and this will turn into what in the present day universe would be a massive elliptical galaxy, of the one of the type uh, we saw in images earlier. Right, so this is already interesting because we control what goes into the simulation. We control uh, the rules of physics, the bits, the information we put in. So, we're, so astrophysics is a very interesting uh, science, right? Unlike other parts of physics, we can't go to the lab and do controlled experiments. Um, the only thing we can do is sit here, perhaps put telescopes in space, and gather photons that are raining down on us from the universe, right? It's a bit like forensic science, right? It's a lot like detective where you get to the crime scene, you don't know what happened, you just have to look at whatever evidence is there to piece together what might have happened. Um, so we can't do direct experiments in the lab, but we can do numerical experiments like this. So this is an example of the same type of simulation. So it's the same volume. You'll see lots of similarities. But what the simulators have done here is turn on and off different bits of physics. So the simulation on the left only has very basic ingredients. It has gravity and it has very basic fluid dynamics. Whereas the simulation on the right is much, well, what we think is much more realistic. It includes, for example, the interplay between stars exploding through supernova, feeding back energy to galaxies. It includes supermassive black holes also injecting energy and heating up uh, the gas in galaxies. And you can see that when you let these two universes evolve, you end up with very different types of universes, very different types uh, of galaxies. So we run this simulation and then we compare the output to this vast network of scaling relations we've determined with our observations, right? And because with the simulations we can turn on and off different bits of physics, that allows us to see what mechanisms are key in producing realistic galaxies as the ones we observe in the real universe. So let's go back to this, this beautiful picture, this Hubble Ultra Deep Field. 
So until now, I've shown you what we know about galaxies, about their property based on the most detailed observations we can make and based on these very high resolution, complex, uh, all-encompassing simulations. So that's great, but we want to do, go one step further. Remember our initial question. We want to see what galaxies can teach us about the universe overall. Right, so let, let's look at this. So right, this is a, we looked at this tiny patch of sky for 12 days with one of the most fantastic uh, telescope, and this is what we saw. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots of galaxies there, uh, but there's a lot of empty space too, right? Now, um, if you know something about astro astrophysics, you know that when we're looking at stars, we're looking only at a very small fraction of all the matter that's in the universe, right? Most of the matter is dark and can't be seen. So if we had a telescope that could magically see all this dark matter, the universe wouldn't look empty like this. It would look something like this. We would see that there is matter pretty much everywhere. There's these filaments. This is what we call the cosmic web. You can look at it in more detail on different scales. So, so there's this network of filaments. And when we have, at the intersection of these filaments, we have regions of higher densities which is where galaxies will ultimately, ultimately form. Um, now this is an interesting uh, pr problem in some sense because to perform this simulation, well it's not easy, don't get me wrong, uh, it takes a lot of uh, you know, complicated programming and very, very powerful computers, uh, but the physics involved in this is relatively well known. So we can start with supercomputers, we can relatively easily start with the physics of the early universe and produce something like this, where the dark matter is distributed. What's really difficult for people to do simulations is to implement galaxies. So the physics that leads to the formation of galaxies is very nonlinear. It's very difficult to reproduce in a supercomputer. So they take us as far as this with relatively, uh, a relative level of ease. Now with observations, it's the other way around, right? We can understand the properties of the galaxies themselves. We observe them, as you've seen, we know it, them in you know, relatively exquisite detail. Uh, but it's a challenge to observe these filaments, this dark matter, what composes most of the mass of the universe. So we need to be clever about how we attach those two realities, right? Because um, you know, galaxies, are in some sense, are lighthouses. They form out of this cosmic web, and we want to be able to use their properties and their position to infer something about where the mass is distributed overall in the universe, right? The theorists produce this simulation and tell us we live in this universe that's filled with this cosmic web. That's wonderful, but we'd like to get some evidence that this is indeed a fact, right? So we can look at the position of galaxies and try to use that as a map that tells us where the dark matter is located. The complication, there's always a complication, right, is something that we call galaxy bias. So this might look a bit complicated, I'll, I'll walk you through it. So this shows um, density perturbation in the universe. If you remember, this picture was showing you at the beginning of the cosmic microwave background. We had all these tiny fluctuation, uh, these bumps in this temperature map. All these tiny, tiny fluctua shape, fluctuations given time uh, and gravity have been able to grow and form sort of pockets of high density material in the dark matter. So this is this cosmic web. So these ripples we see here are these density perturbations in the, in the dark matter distribution. Now the little bumps, the smallest wiggles we see are the dark matter halos, the seas where galaxies can form. So they're dense enough that gas can flow into them and that gas can cool and lead to the formation of stars and will produce galaxies. But now the, in, the problem is that all these little bumps are not equal. So if you look on the left here, we have little bumps that are on top of a bigger wave in this distribution, you see? So this would correspond to a galaxy cluster. So it's a part of space where we have a lot of mass altogether. And it's very easy to form galaxies there, right? So let's look at this. So if we look at this line, this dashed line, this is what we call the critical galaxy. So only the little bumps that are above this line will be able to form a galaxy. So if we look on the other side here, this is what we call a void, right? These regions of space 
in between the filaments in the cosmic web that have very little matter. And even if you have these little bumps that would otherwise form a galaxy if they were in a more, you know, in a cluster, for example, uh, because they're in that region of overall low density in the universe, they won't be able to form a galaxy. So this means there's no one-to-one -one link between the presence of a dark matter halo and the formation of a galaxy that we can observe with our galaxy, with our telescopes. And that is very difficult, so we need to understand why this bias might occur. And we also need to understand the physics of galaxy evolution, which we've been discussing before, because right in a big cluster, all the little perturbations will form a galaxy. And as I've shown you, galaxies, when you let them, they interact together, they will merge, they will evolve, they will transform. Um, so we need to be fully aware of the theory that tells us where mass might be and how that mass translates into the visible galaxies that we can observe. Um, so to make that link even further and understand in more detail you know, the nature and properties of dark matter, right, we need to push forward uh, in terms of data and in terms of simulations. Uh, but thankfully, we have all the tools that are coming up. So um, in this beautiful Hubble Deep Field I was showing you that showed us the very earliest galaxies in the universe was made with this telescope, Hubble, uh, which mirror we can see there on the left in this picture. Now, all the astrophysics community is extremely excited at the moment because next year we'll see the launch of what we call the James Webb Space Telescope. So it's the successor of the Hubble, and you can see the mirror of that telescope on the right there. So it's three times as big. And you can imagine the, the reason why we like big telescopes, that the bigger the mirror is, the more photons you catch, right? So you can look deeper, you can have more details uh, about very, very faint galaxies. Now this thing is being built. You can see it to scale here. Um, so it is really a reality. While for years it, it looked like things were delayed, now it's going to launch next year. So this thing is really happening. Now you can see by the scale of it that to produce something like this and to send it in space is quite a challenge, right? There isn't really a rocket where we can put this like that, and just send it to space. So you have to play a trick, and this is where it gets really scary. So this is what will happen when uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is sent into space. It will be sent in this little uh, folded up origami type thing. And once it reaches its position in space, it will start unfolding. So the first thing you saw open were the solar panels. And what's happening here, which terrifies me, because this needs to go well <laughs> when the thing actually flies, so it's opening this massive sail, which is, will serve as some kind of shield. Because you see the telescope is fully exposed. It's up there in space. So the sail will be always oriented to block sunlight from you know, going to the mirror and uh, perturbing the observation. So once that sail is fully open, you will see the mirror snapping into place and the rest of the structure slowly uh, unfolding. Now, we all have our fingers and toss at toes crossed that this will go to plan. Um, as you can imagine, this is very scary and there's no going back up there and fixing it if it doesn't unfold as it should. Um, but we're very optimistic. So at the moment, uh, there's a tremendous excitement in the community because uh, uh, the first call for proposals was announced for this telescope. So the way astrophysics work, right? So I told you, if we wanted to observe the entire sky like we did the Hubble Deep Field, it would take 400,000 years. Can't do that. Um, so that would be fantastic, because we just have an image, and then every astrophysicist would be happy and would take the little bits that interested them. That's not how it works. So it's a competitive process. We need to, if you have an idea and you're desperate to have observations done with a telescope like this, you need to write a proposal, make your case, send it in, and these proposals are evaluated, and it's a competition, really. The best ideas will win time on this beautiful facility. Uh, so there's lots of people right now, this minute, I'm sure, working on their cases uh, to try to win time on this telescope. And it will be game-changing, just like the Hubble Space Telescope has been. Now, I haven't told you much uh, yet about what it is that I actually do in all of this. Uh, well, I work on these general questions, right? I want to study, to use galaxies, uh, to try to understand formation and evolution of the universe. 
But my specific angle is to look at something different, something we haven't talked about yet. So galaxies are mostly made of uh, stars, right? That's what we can see in optical light. But galaxies also have lots of gas. And to look at the gas, we need telescopes like this. So this may not look as pretty as the Hubble Space Telescope, but it's closer to my heart. And it's a beautiful piece of technology. I'll show you, it's, it's, it's impressive as well. So this is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, ALMA. It's located in uh, northern Chile in the Atacama Desert, about 5,000 meter uh, altitude. Um, and it's an array, so when this is a, their telescopes are not really doing much. This is a picture that was taken while the, the thing was uh, being put together. So there's um, 64 of these telescopes that can all work together to produce pictures of the sky, not looking at the stars, not looking at the dark matter, but looking at the gas. And gas is a very fundamental component of galaxies. It's like the blood. Uh, it's what fuels the formation of new stars through which galaxies can grow and evolve. So by tracking where the gas is and how it might come into galaxies, we can really uh, have a, a direct line to, uh, to the physics that drive their formation. Now, this is beautiful, but these telescopes are big and it's equally complicated, so you need things like this. Um, so there's people on the left for scale. So this telescope works by combining the signal from all these different antennae. And to be able to look at different things at, with different, at different scales, we need to be able to move these telescopes around. So we have these gigantic uh, trucks that can uh, move the antennas all over this desert. This is also, this type of telescope is also an extreme challenge for computation. To produce an image of the sky, we need to take all the signal from the individual uh, telescopes, these different antennae, and combine them together. So this is one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world, and it's sitting there, and all it's doing is combining the signal from the antennae to produce images of the sky. So it's an extreme challenge, uh, you know, both for the technology and for the computation. Now, I'll, I'll end with this beautiful picture again because, um, well, it's gorgeous. Right? <laughs> I can look at it forever. Uh, you know, you look at the detail. Every single little thing here is a galaxy. Um, it's, well, it's not only gorgeous. Uh, you know, it's one of the most information-rich images ever taken. It's probably one of the most expensive images ever taken as well. Um, you know, it's on par with the cosmic microwave background, one could say, um, but it looks prettier. Um, yes, and so there's a lot we can learn with these galaxies. We can learn about them themselves, right? We can learn about how they form and evolve, and as I've tried to show you, they can tell us something about the underlying distribution of dark matter in the universe. Now, if you're a clever, and I've listened to this talk, you've probably realized that I haven't mentioned the term dark energy once so far, whereas dark energy is actually the most important thing. It's about 75% of the mass energy density in the universe today. And it's very mysterious, and we don't know much about it. But images like this, using galaxies, again, are probably our best chance of figuring out something about this very elusive, mysterious dark energy. So there are large numbers of exciting projects ongoing at the moment, uh, projects that will tell us a new telescope, a new project that will become uh, operational within the next five, 10 years, uh, some of which being led uh, directly by scientists here at UCL. And what these projects aim to do is to measure the position, distances, and properties of galaxies over very, very, very large areas, deep, and ever to have these large catalogs of galaxies. And when we can not only understand the properties of the galaxies, but where exactly they lie in space, we can understand possibly something about the evolution and expansion of the universe, which might tell us something about this very elusive dark energy. So I hope I've answered some of your questions about the universe. Uh, I do have still millions of questions, so it's <laughs> all right if you have some too. Uh, but then I'll be happy to take some of yours. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. saint -Lange. So we have about 10 minutes for questions, I think, and some friends with microphones roaming around. So. 
Thank you. Fantastic talk and so many questions. Um, at the uh, uh, cosmic microwave background uh, uh, radiation, uh, when it's created, this is an artifact of uh, normal matter, right? This is photons coming from the collapse of plasma and becoming transparent, is my understanding. So how much does that uh, CMB picture reflect the distribution of dark matter? Is it a one-to-one -one mapping or close? And if you project that in your simulations, do you end up with something actually that looks like the observed universe in terms of the, the real location, not just the general picture? Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. So, so, the, so the cosmic microwave background, it's, um, so it was emitted at a very special time in the history of the universe. So until that time, the universe was mostly a big soup where you know, atoms and photons were all mingled together. And what happened at that crucial time is that uh, nuclei were able to track electrons and form normal atoms. So whereas the photons before kept bouncing off electrons and going off in all sorts of directions, now photons can, are free to flow to us. So that's why with normal telescopes, we can't look before that just because photons were massive, they couldn't go anywhere. So this is just to give a bit of, of context. So, uh, but photons were, so the, the, the reason why it's interesting is that those bumps where you had more or less photons that tells us something about the underlying distribution of, of the dark matter. And by looking at um, not only the position, but how the different little lumps are correlated with each other, on what scales do they preferentially lie, uh, tells us something about the evolution of this dark matter underground. There's also information, the fact that the cosmic microwave background is so smooth overall, right? This is photons that comes from all over the sky and in principle, if we just look back, there is no way parts of the universe so distant from each other should have been able to talk to each other versus light. So that tells us that something, you know, it's at some point the universe must have been much smaller for all that information, for everything to become so homogeneous. So by, by it's piecing together all these types of evidence that allow us to you know, go back in time and track uh, you know, the evolution of the universe before then. Oh, yeah. Um, so we can't track one-to-one, -one, you know, all the structures in the universe today to perturbation in the cosmic oh, okay. micro background. Um, sadly not, but there's lots of clever trick we can use. For example, the cosmic micro is in the background and shines through everything that's in the universe between, you know, between us and, and that point. So a, a massive cluster in the foreground, for example, will have effect on the photons from the cosmic micro background. So we can use that tool as well. It's very rich in information. Yeah, the question, gentlemen in the red, I think. Sorry. Hi, thank you very much for your excellent talk. Uh, I wanted to do a question that it's maybe uh, a little awkward as I'm not an expert, but okay. I wanted to know what do you think about Eric Verlinde's theory about not needing dark matter to explain the behavior and the evolution of the universe? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, so, so just again, a bit of context for everybody. So dark matter is very mysterious. So we have evidence that it must be there. If we look at the motion of galaxies, we can infer that there is a lot of mass there. There is something. That's why we say it's there, even though we don't know what it is. Now, there are all sorts of theories that can try to explain all these behaviors without having to fold in this mysterious type of matter that we don't know what it is. And uh, for example, there's something called modify uh, gravity, which is a, a, a try, trying to change the laws of Newton to be able to account for motions of galaxies uh, without having to use dark uh, matter. Um, generally speaking, all these different alternative theories are very good at reproducing one or a few of these behaviors. Um, but there's not, not a single one that can reproduce things as beautifully as our, you know, uh, you know, our cosmological picture. Something that works on the scale of what happens inside a galaxy to reproducing the cosmic web and the overall distribution of galaxies. So I'll wait until we have something like that before uh, forming an opinion. Yes, sir. 
Thank you. I know that recently um, work has been done on rogue planets, and I'm just wondering, because nobody seems to know how many of them there could possibly be, uh, that some of this matter that we're looking at inside galaxies that we can't see isn't an exotic form of matter, it's simply, it's not illuminated. Thank you. Yes, so, th that, so there have been uh, many different theories for the nature of dark matter. And one obvious one is to say it's not exotic, a new type of matter, it's just the normal stuff, except we can't see it. Um, so there was, for example, you could have uh, lots of black holes, lots of small black holes, which are just normal matter, but we can't see them. So that could be a way to explain for all that missing mass. Um, but again, that's where our beautiful cosmic microwave background comes in and other pieces of information where we can uh, infer how much of the dark matter could be made of ordinary matter, and it's a very small fraction. So there's no room for for that to be the only contribution. It's, it's certainly a small fraction of it, uh, but there needs to be something else. There's just not enough normal matter. Hello. Um, probably a bit of a weird question to ask, but I was quite interested in the graph that showed the, um, the clusters and then the groups and then the voids. And I wondered if any work was actually being done on the voids, because if they're areas of kind of low density mm -hmm. and the material hasn't had a chance to evolve, I was wondering if there was any scope for looking like the, pr the material that is there might be a bit more pristine. Mm. It might be kind of like a bit like a, a fossil kind of. So I, I was wondering that, if any, yeah, yeah, anything was being done on those. That's an excellent question. That, that's actually what my PhD thesis was about, mostly. Um, so that's something I know a little about. <laughs> um, yes, indeed. So there's a lot of interest in, in studying uh, you know, very low mass galaxies, and especially those in low density environments like these voids, exactly for the reason you say, because they're pristine, they're uh, untouched. So people think they might be analogs to the first galaxies that were produced in the universe. And from the pictures I've shown you, you might realize that it's really hard to directly study these first galaxies. So if we had galaxies just in our backyard, that would be analogs, that would be really interesting. Um, so what I did for my PhD when I, I did this you know, a, a while ago, um, it was theorized that we could look in these voids and find um, galaxies, dark galaxies they were called, galaxies that would be full of gas, but that gas would somehow never have been able to form stars. And these would have been really interesting in this whole picture for galaxy evolution. Uh, it turns out that we really haven't been able to find lots of these uh, dark galaxies. The, the hunt is still on. Uh, but yes, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, line of study. Oh, oh. <laughs> should we have a gentleman on the top? Hello. Um, yeah, great talk. Thanks very much. But just carrying on with that graph you showed that I didn't really understand, to be honest. Yeah. But at the end of it, where you got the void, yeah. why was yeah. there a bump right at the end after the void? Oh, okay. Well, th this is just a, it's a cartoon, right? It's not an actual represent. It's just to illustrate how it works. So, um, I mean, it's a statistical thing, right? It's when you have events that are rare, they're not impossible, right? So even in a place like a void, you might have one perturbation that's dense enough to form a galaxy, right? Um, so you do have galaxies that pop up here and there, but typically they're very low mass, they're very small because it's you know, just the tip of the iceberg that makes it above that, that critical. That's not based on measurements then, that's just I mean, we have things like that based from measurements or simulation. That, that one is just a cartoon. I think we need to have this gentleman all the way to the top here. Last question. Hi. Um, uh, I was just wondering, like, the Webb telescope, mm -hmm. like, how it's pretty impressive compared to, like, some of our past space telescopes, but how could it be, like, how could our future telescopes be compared to the Webb? Ah. Uh, well... Yes, because we always need to think about the next bigger thing, right? Um, it's not enough that this is coming online next year. We need to think about the next thing. Absolutely right. Um, 
so, uh, I mean, there's lots of different telescopes <gasps> coming. Obviously, if you do telescopes on the ground, you can do much bigger than that. Now, there's a, a new generation. So right now, telescopes on the ground, the biggest ones, have m mirrors that are about 10 meters in diameter um, for scale. I mean, th so this James Hope is about six meters. So the biggest ones right now are 10 meters on the ground. There's a couple of telescopes now uh, being planned and starting being built that the next generation. They will be 30 meters in size. Um, you can only do this on the ground, obviously, at the moment. Um, so th that will be the next thing, the next big thing. Right, the idea of putting telescopes in space, because it's, you get rid of the atmosphere, which is, you know, makes it difficult to see uh, with fine details. But now we have technology to beat the atmosphere. We have something called adaptive optics. So we can make this mi these mirrors not just a single solid piece of glass, as they used to be, but they're very complex pieces of technology with lots of you know, thousands of little motors that can ch change the shape of the telescope in real time to compensate for fluctuations in the atmosphere. So we, can, we now have the technology to be you know, smart enough to be able to produce on the ground telescopes that will work almost as well as telescopes in space. So if it's not possible to send the successor of James Webb, uh, you know, a even bigger, better telescope in space, we might be able to do it from, from the ground thanks to this technology. Perhaps you can come back and see us in a few years and tell us how you did it. <laughs> So uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Saint-Ange for a tremendous tour of the galaxies. Thank you very much.